Hi everybody, welcome. My name is Rachel Connolly. I am the Director of STEM Education at WGBH, Boston's PBS station, and I serve as the Professional Development Lead for the Worldviews Network. This is the training video for A Water Story, and I'm joined by Dr. Kachun Yu at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, who will be joining us momentarily to walk us through the storyboard and content of this program. So just to start briefly, with where the history of this program has come from. It originally premiered at the Gates Planetarium at the Denver Museum on May 24, 2011. And this content broadly will address issues of water and its importance in the climate framework um, that we really found important to draw on from NOAA's climate literacy framework. So the main principles that we address with this program are how water plays a role in the climate system in the larger Earth system and what its influences are between atmosphere, clouds, ice, land, and life. Um, we thought it would be also really important to address freshwater resources, particularly in the American West, and its role in how drought and other human health issues play into the story. So to um, look at the entire global climate literacy framework that we have from NOAA and how our story aligns to it. You can see that at the end of the storyboard module that's available on worldviews.net. And to share that storyboard with you, I'm now going to turn it over to Kachun. So Kachun, why don't you take it from here? Thank you, Rachel. Um, welcome everyone to this PD event. Um, I'm broadcasting from lovely Denver, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go ahead and switch over to share my screen, and we can take a look at um, the storyboard. And so this is uh, the storyboard on Google Docs. Um, as Rachel said, it's linked from the worldviews.net site, but it has a link to the installer files. As Rachel mentioned, there are climate literacy principles at the very end. But what I will be doing is going through the storyboard. And as you can see, um, we have it broken down by scenes. We have narrative uh, blocks in the second column. We have Uniview commands in the third. We have screenshots and links to individual files in the fourth, and then further information in the last column. But I will be pretty much following the storyboard, although I won't be going through every single aspect of it. But if you follow along, you can see um, which buttons um, and what I am toggling on and off through the storyboard. So I recommend um, this as a resource for um, helping you develop your own version of this particular story. So with that, let's get, go ahead and get started. And what I um, am looking at is Uniview. And we've loaded um, the particular profile for the story, a global water story. and one thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to load the layer set. So there is a load layer set button in the custom events. And as you can see, um, a bunch of layers have um, come up. And we'll attend to those momentarily. But um, as we are um, want to do with these narratives, we actually go th uh, because and because we can do, uh, often do these in the planetarium, we our stories um, are done in a, uh, a cosmic through global to regional to local scale um, type of perspective, and so um, we're actually going to skip a number of um, parts um, early on in the storyboard. But I just want to jump and talk about the orc cloud. And the reason why we bring this up is um, we want um, to talk about water in the context of not just um, on planet Earth, but um, throughout the universe. And so um, one important aspect of this is that water is can actually be found much more frequently or much more abundantly in um, the rest of the solar system. Um, so um, in the Oort cloud, um, in the comets of the Oort cloud, as well as in the Kuiper Belt. And I'm going to go ahead and turn off the Oort Cloud. And I think I've, um, let me see if I can toggle on some planetary orbits as well. <coughs> and so um, here's the Kuiper Belt of comets just beyond the orbit of Neptune. And <coughs> the important point here is that 
water is not a rare commodity in the universe. We um, see it in comets and asteroids in the outer moon systems, um, but they um, are very inaccessible, um, often in frozen form and, of course, very far away. And so um, <clears throat> water um, is um, best accept accessible on the planet that we live. Um, as we fly in, uh, I have the habitable zone turned on. And um, another point that we make is that there are different habitable zones in the solar system. Um, and this one point um, shows the Earth orbiting in the center of it with Venus and Mars on the outskirts. And the point that we make in the storyboard, and you can see more details, is that we think um, all three planets, uh, Earth, Venus, and Mars, probably started off very similarly with similar conditions. But because Earth was in the middle of the habitable zone and because of other factors, it remained relatively habitable over the last four and a half billion years of the solar system's history, while Mars and Venus have evolved into very different states. So let's keep on zooming out or zooming in. And as we fly down, we're going to now investigate um, water at the scale of the Earth. Yeah, let's see if I can turn off. And I will just add, Katoon, that people in the audience really did find it very interesting that the Oort cloud was, you know, one of the sources of water. So getting back to the source and the bigger picture was mm -hmm. so important for them. So it's great that you started there. Yeah, context, as we've discovered with our audiences, is extremely important. So here is another um, extremely useful um, graphic based on our um, surveys with our audiences. Um, these are visualizations of all the water in the world, including um, all ocean water. And then, but um, only about 3% of that is fresh water, and then 2% of that 3% is locked up in ice in the Arctic and Antarctic, Ar Arctic and in glaciers. And so the point here is that even though we think of Earth as being the water planet, and you can see that um, there is um, quite a bit of blue on the surface representing the water, as well as white in the clouds, um, less than 3% of it is fresh water, and even um, less than that is accessible as liquid fresh water. So that, um, again, highlights the point that um, water is a, um, an important commodity on Earth, even though um, we think of it as a, com uh, a very common resource. Um, Kachun, the way you presented that in the dome, which had a lot of impact on people, was that the smallest sphere isn't visible here and was represented by an M&M. &M. Is that correct? Um, yeah, like yeah the, 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 the one analogy that we used was that if you assume that all the water was equivalent to a gallon-sized bucket, um, then the amount of fresh water is equivalent to about three shot glasses worth. And um, and then the total amount of liquid fresh water is about one shot glass. Okay. And uh, but the amount of accessible surface liquid water, as opposed to groundwater, is equivalent to only about an M and M's worth. So the volume of an M and M. So that is a correct analogy. All right. So with that, um, let's go ahead and turn off the water spheres. And what we're going to do is we're going to jump to Asia. I have a bookmark and a custom event button for that. And I'm going to also um, toggle off the planetary um, atmosphere effects. And the reason why we start off in Asia is because it gives us a really good example of where um, water is on the Earth. It's not random that um, we find water where we find it. And the, um, here in Asia, we see a really good example of how this works. You have storms and monsoons coming off of the Indian Ocean onto the Indian subcontinent and into Southeast Asia. And as you can see, the southern, the lower half of the screen, the landmass is green or greener. Um, and then in the middle of the screen, we have the Himalayan mountain range. Um, and you can see the snow capped peaks in that range. And the, um, the mountains act as a barrier wall and result in an orographic effect so that. Um, the air rises and it gets colder and um, the moisture precipitates out. 
and as a result, you can see that Tibet, the Tibetan Plateau to the north of the Himalayas, is extremely dry. It um, has a very different color. And so this is a very um, good example of why you have um, snowpack where it is. And of course, the snowpack, um, as it melts, feeds the great rivers in Asia and, um, and gives um, drinking water to um, over 2 billion people. And this sort of analogy of where water um, it piles up in the form of snow and how it melts and feeds um, thirsty human populations is repeated around the world, including in the American West. And as we keep uh, moving, one, um, we want to stop off in the Middle East, um, specifically at the Egyptian-Israeli border in the Sinai Peninsula, and what we're seeing is literally the border running north-south here. I'm not lining it with my mouse, but you can see that there's also a color difference between the Israeli side, which um, looks darker, um, greener, versus the Egyptian side, which looks brighter and more deserty. And this is entirely a result of um, land management practices that are different. Um, the fact that on the left-hand side, there are still um, pastoralists, shepherds with goats and sheep um, that um, eat the landscape. And on the right-hand side in Israel, um, much of that has been replaced by mechanized um, Western-type agriculture. And as a result, this is a very clear example where um, you can literally see from space um, how differences in landscape management can actually literally change the appearance of that land. And I will just add that that was incredibly impactful of our audience as well in addition to the water sphere volume image. So those were the two that really emerged as the most surprising and I didn't know that you could actually see human manage differences in human uh, activity from space in such a way. So that was yeah. a great story. Yeah, so, so even though you know, the Middle East seems um, somewhat remote to our story, uh, it's an important um, place to land. And, and um, so I highly recommend it. And as, and as we will see um, towards the end, um, we go, um, mention some other uh, facts about the Middle East as well that um, help round out our story. So um, we have the NAIP high resolution layer turned on right now, but I'm going to go ahead and turn that off in the geoscope window. Uh, but that allows us to go down to one meter scale resolution in the continental US. But what I'm going to point out here is that um, just like in Asia and in the Middle East, you can actually see differences in the landscape that reflect the amount of water and the amount of vegetation. And uh, we do have some precipitation maps um, in the geoscope layer um, set, and they were talked about in the storyboard. But I'm going to avoid. I'm going to skip that, but just point out that um, you can see that the eastern half of the U.S. Um, is much darker, much greener, and so it receives more precipitation. Whereas the western half um, looks brighter, browner, and yellower, and tanner. And this is where. Um, we find the dry uh, American Southwest, and the greener parts are the locations of the mountain ranges. And of course, the Pacific Northwest is also very green. But this highlights the fact that if you are trying to grow crops in the US, you can rely on rainfall in the eastern half. But in the western half, there just is not enough rain. And so you have to rely on irrigation. And um, then again, um, much of that irrigation water comes from um, water that's been stockpiled in, um, in um, snow in the mountain peaks. So um, this, again, is analogous to what we are seeing in the Himalayas. All right, so with that, let's um, <coughs> zoom in um, to Colorado. And what I am going to do is, you know, we talked about um, precipitation in North America, but I will turn on the precipitation map for Colorado. And for those of you who are not familiar with Colorado, uh, I will also turn on some cities as well. But um, Colorado is uh, part half mountains and half um, Midwestern plains. And so the eastern half of the state um, really merges with um, Kansas and, um, and has a relatively flat 
um, geography. And as you can see, um, there are um, major cities in Colorado are along the Front Range, just to the east of the um, the Rocky Mountains, and the mountains are highlighted by the blue of um, where you see most of the um, the rainfall and the snowfall. But here we have Fort Collins, Boulder, Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, and Trinidad um, close to the New Mexican border. But uh, the point here is that uh, most of the population of Colorado lives on in the uh, east of the Continental Divide, so point so like 80 percent, whereas 80 percent of the moisture falls um, to the west of these cities. And so an important point that we also stress with our audiences is that water isn't often where you need it. Now, um, before we continue with that thought, I also want to point out the fact that um, Colorado also provides water to um, not just um, to residents of the state, but to other states as well. And um, <clears throat> we can't seem to find the um, the other state borders, but um, we can see rivers flowing um, to the east, which uh, flow into the Mississippi watershed, and then also to the south, to New Mex Mexico, and um, to the Rio Grande, um, out to the Gulf, and then finally to the west, where it provides water to Utah, um, Arizona, Nevada, and California. And as I uh, mentioned earlier, um, a lot of this um, water doesn't necessarily um, <coughs> go um, to where it's needed. And so what we have done um, in the last um, hundred years is actually pr um, create a huge amount of infrastructure to, um, to move the water. And so I've turned on. Um, it might be hard to see, but um, I've turned on the blue lines representing the rivers, and here this um, extra thick line is the Colorado River going through Utah, and then um, Arizona, and then finally into um, Lake Mead up here uh, in, at the border with Nevada, and then down towards California um, out into the Gulf of, um, of Baja. Um, but you also see all these red lines, and these are um, artificial structures, canals and ditches and tunnels that have been built um, over the last hundred years to uh, move water to where the people are. And so in this case, we have um, lots of people living in Arizona, uh, Phoenix and Tucson, Central Arizona Project provides water. Um, we have farms in Southern California as well as uh, cities in Southern California that take Colorado River water, Las Vegas, and so forth. And then if we come back to Colorado, we can also see that there are orange um, lines representing tunnels that literally burrow underneath the um, high, uh, some of the highest peaks in the Rocky Mountains um, to bring water um, over the Continental Divide and it uh, feeds the um, growing cities that um, are east of the divide, including Denver and the Denver metro area, Boulder, Fort Collins, and Colorado Springs. So one of the um, points that um, we like to make is that there ha we, we've had to construct all of this infrastructure over the last hundred years to provide water. But there are also challenges. The fact that um, the cities in the western U.S. are some of the fastest growing ones um, in the entire nation. And so we have a problem of both population growth and um, we are also expecting to see um, less water over time. So here is a plot of the amount of water um, that's in the reservoirs of Lake Mead and Lake Powell over the decades since they've been filled. And you can see that um, since the year 2000, there has been a substantial drought that has decreased the amount of available water at the same time that the population in the Colorado River Basin, shown by this red line, is also um, increasing. Um, we have lots of examples um, in the pictures and, and the, um, the storyboard, um, but we have other slides showing uh, some of the um, not so good um, water use practices in the American West, but um, like all World Reach Network stories, we like to highlight the positive. 
um, you know, and, and there are uh, many challenges, um, especially in a warming world where precipitation patterns are expected to change and you're also expected um, to have less water available. But as it turns out, there um, probably are um, good solutions. Um, in the American West, uh, anywhere from 75 to 90 percent of the water use is actually used by agriculture um, for our farms to grow crops. But oftentimes we do it in extremely, um, you know, um, not very good ways, such as um, the use of um, flood irrigation or through um, center pivot irrigation where the water is sprayed um, down from high up, which um, ends up wasting a lot of water. And here we can go back to the Middle East where we see examples of farming that's done in much, much harsher conditions than anywhere that you'd find in the American West. And through the use of drip irrigation systems and innovative greenhouses and advanced technology to keep um, minerals from building up in those irrigation systems, um, Israel, Jordan, Egypt, farmers in those countries have been able to grow crops in um, extremely harsh environments. And so that is a lesson that um, we can have for ourselves, that if we can perhaps even save 10% um, of the water in, um, our, in our irrigation, we um, can help stave off the effects of um, climate change as well as um, an in increasing population. And um, that um, is, sort of rounds out um, our story, and um, I've um, gone through it um, extremely quickly. And again, I want to point you to the storyboard if you want um, more information and more details. Great. Thanks, Kachun. I just want to follow up by saying um, there's a couple points that might be interesting about what we learned when we presented this with the audience in Denver. Um, one of the things the audience really responded to was mostly um, the stories at the global level. Many of their feedback um, focused on how their surprise at how small uh, the accessible water is for humans on the earth and they did mention often that water sphere image that we found very helpful in many of our water-based worldviews programs. Um, also at the local level, the um, concept of how much populations really depend on water and that there's this infrastructure that exists for that was another really important point. Um, and this is, again, the imagery that people really um, resonated with them. The other thing that's very interesting is how the combination of the visuals and the technology as well as the pedagogy and live speaker aspect played into an important part about what they liked the most. It wasn't just about the content, although we found interestingly that it was really evenly distributed across all three of these areas, almost exactly. So that was sort of a nice touch. Um, finally, a lot of the dome capacity to help people understand the geography of the Earth and the planet systems and how they all fit together in complex uh, interrelationships with each other was finally a real value added piece of having um, these visuals in a dome. So um, Kachun, I'm going to go back to you for a moment and just sort of talk about how you and the Denver Museum have continued to use this um, after you premiered it, how you found it valuable to use it with a couple of other interesting sort of programs and what were the community partnerships that you developed to deliver this particular water story in your institution? Sure. Well, um, we uh, did um, spend some time um, looking for uh, partners, and uh, luckily we were able to find um, this organization called the Colorado Foundation for Water Education, a group that tries to educate the public as well as policymakers throughout the state about water issues. And they were extremely helpful, and, um, and through their um, network, we were able to link up with others who were um, able to advise us on our story as well as provide resources, data, pictures, and so forth. And um, so for instance, um, one of the things um, that I pointed out earlier was um, the water infrastructure. Um, and um, here um, we actually went and um, took a panorama of um, some of these pipes that are literally bringing water across the Continental Divide. 
um, down in this case to Fort Collins. But um, the data sets that um, that I've uh, that you've seen and that I've alluded to, and the many more that um, we haven't shown or talked about, um, have been really um, useful because, um, as um, we see in our um, presentations to the public, um, but also in a lot of the other World News Network programs, um, water is, of course, a um, very important concern for many people in this country. And it turns out that a lot of these resources can be um, reappropriated for use in completely different stories. Now, of course, some of these um, data sets showing um, the Colorado River system um, isn't that useful for anyone not living um, in the Colorado River Basin, but um, it, I think um, the story um, narrative points that you find in the storyboard will give you ideas on how to um, create your own story um, that's relevant to your own particular audiences. And as far as um, you know, what we continue to do with um, these um, story elements, as I said, um, we have found them useful um, for our other programs, but uh, because of our collaboration with the Colorado Foundation for Water Education, we have done a lot of other events where we've taken out our portable geodome out into the field and um, worked um, in uh, taking it to meetings um, that um, we were invited to um, through our network with um, networking with CFWE. And so we've been able to impact uh, far higher numbers of people outside the museum than um, just the ones inside or, um, who were able to come to our particular talk just because um, of, of our connections. So it's been a great um, way to collaborate with um, an outside institution. And it sounds like it's been a really great way to sort of bring new audiences to the planetarium and tell new stories that have continued to resonate with your communities. So um, we really, uh, you know, Kachun, do you have any last words before we sign off? Uh, no, I mean, I think, um, you yeah, know, the fact that uh, it's been um, a great experience developing the story. And so I hope um, all these resources that we're making available find use with you um, out there in the ISC community. Great. Thank you, Kachun. And I think that um, that's going to be all for the Global Water Story training video. We hope you find all of the resources for this module as well as many other content modules on our site, worldviews.net. And um, enjoy the capacity and building that capacity to tell the water story in your community. Thank you very much. Thanks, everyone.